All right, I want to kind of start talking uh, about Aaron. Uh, um, um, I asked him to kind of, for him to say kind of where he sees conservatism. We were talking a little about it too, but kind of some people were up and gone. But why don't you start off and, and, and say uh, what you were telling me that modern conservative, young conservatives or whatever. Uh, yeah, so what I was to say, I grew up uh, religious, obviously, and as pretty much the only conservative everywhere I went. Uh, in my religious community, it was all progressive Jews. In my non-religious community, it was uh, millennial high schoolers who had all of their social justice projects. And the view of conservatism reflected back at me was very much I, I use the, I reference McCarthy as kind of the emblem of people's perceptions of conservatism. Someone uh, angry and reactionary and racist was sort of the, the prevailing themes of the perception of conservatism. And yeah, I don't, I don't. And you saw kind of some kind of difference happening with. Uh, with you know, Obama's yeah. presidency. Yeah. yeah, so post, when Obama won the presidency, I took, you were talking about divisions along the conservative movement, it sort of brought them out into the open, and we had the Tea Party come through, and we were sort of in the process of defining what the next step of conservatism is going to look like, if it's going to be a more fusionist conservatism, or if it's going to go uh, in a really bad direction, or if it's going to go somewhere else. That's kind of what we're in the process of figuring out in the public view. How does that relate to your thinking, Madeline? I think so, yeah. From what I've experienced, a similar thing where I went to public school and it was just the liberal social justice warriors teaching me um, until I went to a classical high school and then at Hillsdale College, I've experienced much different. But it's um, interesting at Hillsdale to see all the different like factions of um, conservatism and how they did really come out, especially during the, um, the election time of Trump and before that. Now, you are hiding your name, so tell me again what it is. Anna, I'm sorry. A-N-N-A? -N -N -A? Yeah. All right. What? How about you? Does that story relate to you at all, or you come from a different direction? No, I do relate to that story. I'd say it's pretty, pretty autobiographical. Yeah, I think you know, growing up Catholic, um, even a lot of the Catholics that I know are pretty much liberals, and a lot of the Christians that I know are kind of liberal. So I would say it relates. Yes. And. Was there some period of change, or did this, uh, did you see any kind of switch change, or just maybe you meeting new challenges, or maybe even you meeting new people or new something? Was it kind of, you think, uh, historical or personal or? For you? I think that things got a lot nastier when Trump was elected because there were a lot of people who really liked him, but then a lot of the people who I had kind of assumed were more Republican or more traditional really came out against him. And so that was just kind of another line that was drawn. So you kind of make a bigger distinction with Trump, but do you think it's Obama? Um, I think Obama was the start of it. I personally think Trump is too recent to be talking about. I realize we have to because we live in the world, but I, I don't think we, we've settled the shockwaves of what Trump has done yet well enough to look back on it. Mm -hmm. And I had a slightly different uh, view of things. How about you, Jack? In, uh, well, well the first, the easy question. Do you think it changes with Obama or Trump? I think, it start, I think like Aaron, it starts with Obama, but it really becomes exposed in Trump. As in, um, I granted my memories are a little bit vaguer, but um, it didn't seem that there was the um, animosity within the Republican Party towards either John McCain or Mitt Romney. 
and it seemed that um, they kind of they they kind of elected compromise candidates in a sense, and nobody was really really passionate for John McCain or Mitt Romney, but at the same time, no one was really vociferously against them, save for the fringe people on the left. And so um, I think in that sense, we really didn't, we really kind of got, a, at least on the surface, the United Republican Party. And then once Trump came in and started making, started making, uh, started making headlines and everything, I think that's when the real uh, differences in opinion really, were really kind of exposed uh, in a large scale in the Republican Party with a lot of former notable conservatives like George Will just completely jumping ship. That, that I, to my recollection, I don't remember that happening in either 2008 or 2012. Granted, one of you could probably correct me on that, but I don't remember there being a mass movement out of the Republican Party, at least among major talking heads, um, under either McCain or Mitt Romney. No, the only ones who were doing it were academics, like the guy who wrote that book. Uh, uh, could you uh, move that up here so I can use it as a prop? Uh, 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 I guess. Yeah. All right. Pat Buchanan in 1992, but that was huh? much before my time. Well, this actually was written during the Obama period, so, uh, but to me, the change was just before him. It was uh, George W. Bush. And George W. Bush was mush in terms of philosophy. And what's cl clear to say it. Uh, um, um, intellectual conservatives like me, especially older ones, um, were very upset about him. I'll tell you a story with him. American Conservative Union, which at the time I was uh, vice chairman of, uh, uh, held their 50th anniversary party. And of course, what you want to do is have somebody exciting so you have the President of the United States who was George W. Bush. Yeah. And George W. Bush uh, uh, came and gave a speech there uh, uh, and basically was praising all the things he was doing to grow government and make government better, all right? Uh, and what annoyed me so much, it was a big Washington hotel all maybe four or five thousand people there. Um, all the conservatives are rising up, up cheering him for these. Now he had some conservative things he's talking about too, but cheering all these things, building the welfare state, regulating it more. You know, he, uh, you, you all, I'm sure, are aware of the entitlement crisis we have uh, financially. He put a new entitlement in on top of all the other obligations. Uh, um, uh, and that's just one. But anyway, I'm sitting there and all of the conservatives are getting up cheering this stuff. All right, I knew it was over then. I mean, that's when I knew I had to write this book. Interestingly, uh, I, I've had a nutty life. Uh, Interesting, a friend of mine who is the top uh, 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 columnist, conservative uh, type columnist at the time, Robert Novak, then he wouldn't know his name. Uh, but anyway, he's sitting at the table in back of me and he's watching that everybody's getting up applauding, but I'm not. So, and he didn't like all the liberal things that, uh, 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 that uh, Bush was doing either. So the next day, I pick up the Washington Post and its conservative leader refuses to stand for the president. <laughs> this is the head of the title. Now, Novak at the time was the biggest, the, the conservative with the largest number of 
uh, columns around the country, right? Two, 3,000 uh, major newspapers. <laughs> About me not standing up for the president, cheering him. Uh, um, uh, so that's why I trace this just one generation back. Uh, now, I may be wholly wrong, maybe he was a wonderful president, but he wasn't doing what, what Hayek and what uh, uh, Meyer, who we'll talk about in a while, uh, uh, or Buckley, or any of the, uh, the old conservatives were, uh, yeah? Could you even trace that back to his father and his presidency? Because it seems to me that um, that kind of big government conservatism really, I mean, it, it, it was disrupted with Reagan and then George H.W. came in and then he started, I think he kind of foreshadowed his son in a lot of ways. Yeah, he did in a lot of ways. And I'll tell you uh, a funny story, uh, well, a story about that too. Uh, um, at the convention where George H.W. Bush, the father, uh, is taking over from Reagan to, to run for the presidency. He says, my administration is going to be a kinder and gentler uh, administration. Nancy Reagan is sitting there and turns over the person next to her and says, in a voice loud enough to hear, Kinder and gentler than whom? Uh, all right. Um, you're right. I, I, and of course, there's always been the, the, the philosophical and the pragmatic uh, politicians uh, um, uh, in politics. And most of them are pragmatic. Reagan was the incredible exception. I mean, he actually changed things. Uh, um, I mean, in fact, what Republicanism, uh, Republicans were most known for was not changing things, right? As Hayek criticized them for, they never did anything, all right? They, they just kept things going the way they were. Uh, it was Reagan who was the, 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 in a sense, the strange one, the guy off the message here. He was trying to change stuff. Uh, 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 um, uh, um, and it started there, but uh, but at least the father kind of pretended he was kind of a conservative. Uh, I, um, uh, uh, and that was a statement, and he kept pretty quiet about it. Uh, uh, but his son ran his whole campaign on compassionate conservatism uh, as opposed to nasty conservatism, which is part of that um, um, impression of what conservatism was. Uh, uh, and it's easy to make uh, a small government look mean. You're taking money away from poor people and old people and all that, uh, I mean, We've got uh, entitlement, Social Security, uh, Medicare, Medicaid, uh, uh, um, farm subsidies, uh, civil service retirement system. Um, uh, we've got enormous, enormous uh, 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 debts, and yet if you try to do anything, you hate old people, right? Uh, um, uh, so it's not surprising at all that you grew up with uh, people thinking conservatives were mean. Uh, because, uh, you know, Aristotle goes right back to the beginning. In democracies, you can't tell people no. Huh? It's, you know, Churchill, as opposed to us, said uh, democracy is the worst form of government except every other one. Uh, but ours is, uh, uh, it's a very hard system to make work. You can't tell people no. The terrible uh, uh, debt that we talk about, even one of the Democratic governors running is against all this debt, $21 trillion. 
the promises we made in the entitlement program are 121 trillion. I mean, the, the, the deficit we all talk about, worry about is peanuts compared to this stuff. And if you try to talk about doing anything about them, all these people with hair my color get mad at you. <laughs> uh, and their kids, because they don't want to take care of them. Uh, so it's very hard to run a reasonable kind of government that way. And it does look mean. Uh, um, uh, so the easy thing to do, and I don't blame the, either of the Bushes, although I, I spent half of my life running people against them, <laughs> uh, uh, more than half of my life. Uh, um, uh, but I, I, deep down, I don't blame them. It's very hard to say no. Uh, John mentioned what the papers call me, the Grinch in the pinstripe suit when we had the first separations from government. All right, the first time we've tried to we tried to slim it down at all, and we, and we got rid of maybe a hundred people or eighty people at the time at a two million. Uh, 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 the, and in those days, the New York Times rarely had a picture, but they did then of me looking like the Grinch in a pinstripe suit, uh, all right? The Washington Post the, the, on their uh, Sunday magazine had a picture of me uh, uh, up there uh, 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 calling me uh, Reagan's Rasputin of the reduction in force. Uh, uh, um, uh, when I cut back on uh, uh, abortion funding, uh, the top columnist for the New York Times called me Daddy Divine, telling women uh, what they can do with their babies. Uh, uh, um, uh, uh, you don't make any friends uh, 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 doing it. John mentioned that. I used to give lectures during the Reagan administration when I was the personnel director saying, if you want to be a success in Washington, don't do anything. What's happened? So suppose you, by some miracle, get a job like I had, all right? Don't do anything. At the end, I say, you know, I haven't heard anything bad about that guy. Yeah. I hired a guy to be uh, my uh, second director in a political campaign, uh, a, a presidential one, Bob Dole. Not that much a conservative, but he wasn't Bush. Uh, uh, um, uh, I hired the guy in a, a old wise politician, old even to me, uh, uh, called me up and said, Don, I hear you hired so-and-so. And I said, yeah, yeah. You know, it's getting a lot of pressure. I had to get somebody in there who they think of as a normal kind of political uh, guy. And I was in charge of the presidential campaign at this time, not for that long, but I was. And... Uh, so he said, uh, I haven't heard anything about anything bad about that guy. I said, yeah. And he said, means he never did anything. And, and, and that's, that is the secret. You want to be a success in the life? Don't do anything. Just do enough to get there. And smile a lot and be nice to folks. Uh, and you'll be a success. Uh, uh, um, and that's why pure traditionalism, and uh, Hayek is right, pure traditionalism can't do anything. Right? You've got to have this open spirit uh, 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 of freedom to do anything. Uh, uh, all right, I, I, and that leads well into uh, uh, our... Uh, Meyer section, but uh, first uh, John's asked two questions, and, and um, as I do. Uh, by the way, as you notice, I, I, I kind of like to involve you guys in here. In fact, normally I don't even lecture uh, as much as I did before. Uh, uh, 
but I didn't know where you guys and gals were coming from, so I figured I'd go through it. Uh, um, but anyway, I'm going to ask you, uh, you've had, some of you have had uh, uh, um, um, uh, know something about Hayek. He asked, what is Hayek, uh, why does Hayek say economic planning is impossible? All right. I'm going to ask you. Um, I says the economic plan is impossible because if I'm remembering his argument correctly, um, I might be confusing the character's thesis. Um, it's the idea that it's that that, these, that, that uh, a central planner, a planning economy, or a central planner cannot <coughs> do, uh, yeah, the central planner cannot know exactly. There's so many different elements to the economy. All right. Do you remember anything I put up there that kind of, uh, how do I, where are we? If I go back, I'll go back in this one. Yeah, there's so many, like, yeah, like, there, there's so many moving parts to an economy, so many different, so many different, sometimes conflicting interests and components of human nature that planned economy just doesn't take into account the things that by you know, mathematical precision, scientific rigor, you can uh, straight jacket. All right. You're right, and, and Mises said that too. Uh, 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 and it is, it's the argument for the marker, Adam Smith. Uh, you just can't know it. All right, so you say, well, what are all these right wing guys, all right? There's a guy by the name of Paul Light. Uh, Paul Light's a professor at New York University, uh, the kind of middle right kind of progressive liberal uh, professor that you would expect to find uh, in political science. He's also a, uh, 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 a fellow at the Brookings Institution in Washington. You couldn't be more conventionally uh, progressive uh, today. Uh, he, uh, he's led many, three or four different uh, major reviews of, of government, how it works for the, uh, the, basically the Democrats when they were in control uh, of Congress uh, and written a lot. He's the top public administration professor in America. Paul Light says, you cannot manage the government today in the United States. It can't be done. And I was head of it. And my normal lecture would be more on this subject. Uh, uh, um, uh, he says there are 60 levels of government bureaucracy in the federal government between the secretary at the top and where it meets real people at the bottom. And there's no communication device between them, the top and the bottom, that works. Mises' greatest book is called Bureaucracy, all right? It's a small volume, highly recommended. It tells you everything about the answer to this question John uh, asked. Uh, the difference between the private sector and the public sector is, and why the private sector can do complicated things and the public sector cannot, is that it has a mechanism that communicates between different levels. All right, does anyone know what that is? Prices. Huh? Prices. Budget? No, no, prices. Prices, yeah. Yeah, 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 right. Prices, profit, and loss, right? If you're at the top, you can go to every division below you and ask, is it making a profit or not? Is it giving, or even more tech, is there a return on investment that's uh, high enough or not, all right? 
every, no matter how big it is. And yet the private sector, interestingly, has decentralized radically over time. But it has this technology, it can go. What is the equivalent device in the government? Now you say budgets, and that's what every uh, uh, public administration uh, book says. Why are you shaking your head no? I didn't say budget, I, said, I just said prices oh. for the private sector. Yeah, but I know you, you said it, but then changed it, all right? Okay. All right, but any event, that isn't important. <laughs> uh, and I'm not blaming you for this. This is what everybody says. It's the budget. Now think about it. What does the budget tell you in government? that to give you some indication what's going on there. They ask for something, all right, and then you have to decide whether to give it to them. How can you tell whether it's working there or not? Well, let's say the program is to feed uh, hungry children. How do you know that's successful? Well, they, uh, they do utilization studies, right? You have to prove that you spent all the money you got last time. They ask for more money. S say that from the beginning again. Isn't it they measure it by how much money you spent on the program? Like, so to ask for more money, you have to prove that you spent all your money. Yeah. What happens? You look at it and you say, hey, you know, we still have hungry children, right? So what do you have to do? You have to give them more, all right? It's just the opposite in the private sector. In the private sector, you're looking for success. In the public sector, you're looking for failure, all right? Failure gets you more. <laughs> and that is the system that's sent down from the real mechanism that exist in the private sec in the public sector to measure that uh, it, it, it is the personnel system, uh, the uh, 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 performance appraisal system, it's called. You're supposed to measure it because the people who are in the agencies write up what they've done and, and how successful they've been in it, and the bosses are supposed to evaluate them. You know the name Jimmy Carter at all? He was the president, all right? Jimmy Carter got elected by being a progressive who admitted our programs don't work, and what we have to do is reform the bureaucracy. Uh, uh, and he did, all right? He, 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 at this time in the nomination process, he had less than 1% of the vote uh, uh, among Democrats. Uh, and he said, you got to admit these programs aren't working, uh, uh, but we got to then make the government work. So we went in and he did all the right things you do in public administration. Mainly the two main things, if you want to run a, a government bureaucracy you have to do, is you have to have an evaluation system that works where people are evaluating each other's work honestly and you have to have your pay based on those evaluations. And that's basically what he did. Interestingly, he hired, the guy was my public administration professor at Syracuse University to do it. And he knew how to do it. And he put in this great system. Now, unfortunately for Jimmy Carter, he only served one term, all right? And who goes into the job but me, the guy who was his student uh, to run the thing. So I'm walking in there with a great new system to run the place, all right? And he had set it all up. I literally, all I had to do was turn. Of course, all Washington went crazy, you think? Uh, they went crazy with Trump. Can imagine this guy, Reagan, coming in and say, they kind of cut government, uh, cut the number of employees. We had done that to the, the Revolutionary War. Uh, somewhat of an exaggeration, but not much. All right. 
here's this guy coming in there, and so they go crazy, and the Democrats control both houses of Congress, uh, 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 I think, at least the House. But anyway, uh, they go crazy, and they're going to not let us... Uh, 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 all I had to do was turn the key to turn this. They wouldn't let it do it, even though they'd let the Democrat do it. Uh, uh, but in any event, uh, we blocked them uh, on it, and Reagan uh, threatened to veto it. So I did do it, and this thing worked. When people were, about, and the important thing is nobody likes, do you want to tell your uh, subordinate you're not doing a good job? All right? You're not solving poverty, even you know, you're getting paid to do that? All right, no, so what happens in the country? Uh, 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 um, oh, um, uh, Clinton, uh, not Clinton, uh, who am I saying? Carter. Uh, Carter wins by saying, you have some statistic, Nine, over 90% of federal employees all get the same rating. Right? They're not failures and they're not perfect. Uh, over 90% are all rated satisfactory. So they set up a system where you have to rate them on five categories. All right? A uh, little simple thing, but makes a big difference. If you're all rating everybody one category, there's no discipline. There's no yes or no, right or wrong. Everybody goes along, does. So he says 90% uh, percent of them are getting the same rating, uh, and that's what won for him. <laughs> everybody knows you can't have a system work that nobody gets evaluated. Uh, but anyway, we put it in, and you heard all the trouble uh, that I got. Uh, uh, the very next administration, George H.W. Bush, your friend, gets rid of the merit pay part of this thing. All right, the very next one. By the end uh, uh, of his administration, it's all over. You don't have to wait for a Democrat. Uh, in fact, Democrats have much more incentive to make it work than we do. Uh, but they don't because the unions won't let them. Uh, I was just on a panel a couple of weeks ago uh, with the gal who ran uh, the, the uh, personnel reform stuff for uh, uh, Bill Clinton. Uh, and she had all the right ideas. She said, but the unions wouldn't let me do anything about it. Uh, um, so how did we get started on this? <laughs> Uh, oh, 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 why, uh, why central planning is impossible, all right? All right, that's, uh, that's why it's impossible, because it has no signaling device and the one, no real signal, effective signaling device, and the, the one they do have, they don't use. Uh, so obviously, you can't possibly do central planning if it's like that. Uh, uh, Hayek actually explained it a different way, more philosophically, but to me, that's the practical side of this thing. All right, what is a spontaneous order was your uh, other question. Uh, a spontaneous order is not having it run by the bureaucracy. All right, is that enough? All right, any, anyone, I mean, spontaneous means that, that that free people are making free decisions to decide uh, what to do with a minimum amount of coercion. Now, Hayek uh, uh, admits, even Mises admits, you need some kind of legal structure uh, uh, so that, uh, uh, you know, you stop people killing each other and stealing from each other. Uh, uh, but within a minimal structure of government, uh, uh, you should let uh, people freely make choices. Uh, uh, and what's the proof of that? Governments do more of that, do better, than governments that do less of that. Uh, um, in my other uh, course that I normally uh, 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 do, uh, I have a, uh, all kinds of st statistics that have been taken. Uh, whether it's by the UN, the World Bank, uh, Heritage Foundation, uh, the, the more uh, open the government uh, uh, is, the less 
uh, the government does, the more free and successful it is. I mean, it's empirical fact. Uh, uh, it works. Uh, but the problem is that you got to have some government. And once you have some, it wants more. Uh, and, uh, you know, again, back to Aristotle, um, that's the problem we got. And it's very difficult to solve. Well, if uh, some government is inevitably leaves a large government, wouldn't anarchy be the solution? What's that? If small government inevitably leads to the large government that you dislike, wouldn't anarchy be the solution? Anarchy the solution. Now, the problem is anarchy leads to coercion, even more coercion. Uh, 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 in some ways, I'm more of an anarchist than I am uh, a traditionalist. You have to remember I'm Irish, uh, right? Uh, you know, all the people complaining about being in servitude for all this time uh, and for all uh, the suffering uh, blacks have had, and it's terrible. Uh, uh, you know, s slavery was gone in Europe. Uh, 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 for most of its history until we started getting on uh, 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 boats and going around the world, uh, the era of discovery. Uh, uh, as the Stokel uh, mentions, and there are plenty of empirical studies to show it, although no one knows it, uh, 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 slavery was basically outlawed uh, in Europe uh, for a thousand years. Uh, 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 even be no, when I was going to say before Alcunin, but it wasn't. It was um, it was um, the pious. What was his first name? Um, Charlemagne's son, Louis the Pious. Uh, all right, Louis the Pious. Louis the Pirate, uh, who was, as I say, uh, uh, Charlemagne's uh, son, uh, uh, they call him the Pious because when Charlemagne died, uh, all of his sons, uh, uh, no, and Louis the Pious became emperor, uh, all of uh, Louis the Pious' sons we're going to go to war with each other uh, to uh, uh, decide uh, who is going to be the emperor. And they call him the pious because what he did is he broke up the empire with decentralization, federalism. Uh, he broke up the emperor, empire into German and French. And, uh, uh, um, but what happened during his... Uh, Empire, or at the end, when he dies, the, the, the son who would succeed, uh, uh, was supposed to succeed, although his brothers weren't up to it uh, very much. But anyway, he was a, an infant. So his wife, Fertilde, I believe her name was, uh, ran the empire, uh, like 20, 30 years, maybe more, something like that. And she got rid of slavery. Do you women know that the first one who got rid of slavery was a woman? Why isn't she some big hero? Huh? But anyway, uh, here we have uh, uh, Europe without uh, 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 slavery. Oh, I got it because I'm Irish, right? That's how we got it, right? That we were 800 years. Uh, uh, not a couple of hundred years, uh, uh, although it was serfdom is, be is better than slavery, but in any event. Um, so there's a lot of appeal to anarchy to me because that's basically what the peasant Irish had to do for 800 years, all right? Because the government wasn't there to protect them. Uh, the government was there to take advantage of them. Uh, um, but it's a pretty tough life. Uh, it's lived on potatoes. <laughs>
right? Uh, Iron, the great potato famine, forced uh, about a third of the population over here. Uh, anarchy has some positives, but you know, we were probably better off having the English <laughs> on top of it. Uh, or, and we're certainly better off getting on that boat and coming over here, which is the only place that they really put it together right. Uh, and here we are trying to screw it all up. Uh, 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 you know, it's be it, it beginning of the last century, the state, local, government together were bigger than the national government. I mean, and we made this thing the greatest place in the world that, under that system. Huh? Huh? Well, now the solution would just to be make state and local government bigger than, so you get back to that, right? What's that? So now the solution would be to make state and local. That is my solution, baby. You come to it. Uh, it's the end of this book. It's the end of the book I'm writing. It's the end of this. You'll see the, the last slide in my presentation. Uh, no, no, I meant that. Huh? You know, the federal government is bigger than this, and then the, the key would be to make the state and local governments even bigger than that. Yeah. <laughs> local governments have problems, too, but uh, that's why federalism is the real answer. Uh, you need both, but the problem is stopping the feds. The problem is the feds can make their own money, right? I mean, how can you stop that? Uh, they're making their own money. And that's why your friend John is right, Rothbard, you gotta get back to the damn banks, all right? Uh, and have competition between the banks, because as long as they can print their own money and you have no alternative, gold or an alternative currency, uh, they got you. Yeah. And by the way, that's your problem, your generation. Your generation is not all the little things we're talking about today. Your generation's problem is this enormous debt. Not the 20 trillion, it's 120 trillion. That's the problem. It cannot be paid off. The one politician in America that tried to do that, uh, uh, what's his name, became Speaker of the House from Wisconsin. Uh, Ryan. Ryan. Ryan, Ryan, all right. The one guy that tries to attack it, oh, he's, he's the most evil person in the world. He's taking money away from old people. I mean, what could be worse than that? But if you remember his program, it didn't take a penny away from anyone for 10 years and then gradually went in little deeny, deeny, deeny. We can't even talk about that. You can't, and, and, and listen, if you can't discuss it, it's gonna happen, right? I'm not saying, can you do it? I'm not saying, anyone. Anyway, if you can't even talk about it, can you solve it? No. That's your challenge, really. Uh, uh, and why I like to be tough in my lectures because we need tough people to survive this. And I mean tough people. <laughs>